Welcome back to the 10 Adventures Podcast. I'm fascinated by people that live interesting lives, and today I'm excited to talk to author Jeff Powder about his recent book on the climbing legend of Jim Danini. The book, which is called Survival is Not Assured, is a great read, and I highly recommend it. Hi, Jeff. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Richard. Thanks for having me. Before we talk about your book, your career as an author is unconventional. Can you share a bit about yourself? So I, um, I have a background training as a clinical psychologist, and that has been something that um, has always been a really interesting blend with the interest that I have in the outdoors. I have found from a very early age when I first came across mountain literature, even though I didn't live anywhere near mountains, there was something about the world of mountain literature that really captivated me, the, the people, the things that they did, the challenges that they overcame. And that really blended well with the interest I had in, in psychology. And eventually, I became really interested in the psychology of risk-taking, why people do what they want to do, um, how they can take the chances that they do, how they can put themselves into situations that might be as daunting or, or as dangerous as um, certainly mountain adventures can be. And what I really started to um, to want to do is to understand the reasons that that people do that in spite of all the challenges. And I really started to, to find a number of stories of people who uh, had challenges, not just in the mountains, but in other parts of their life as well. And, and this story on um, Jim Danini, this new book that I've done is is very much that, a, a combination of the challenges of mountains, but the challenges of everyday life as well. And I, I really think that those are the, the really interesting stories in outdoor adventure. Yeah. And I, I, I it was you know really interesting, as you say, to, to read about this incredible climbing career and then just the challenges that we all have in our you know day-to-day -day life. Um, the book starts with this gripping tale of a trip gone wrong in Alaska. And why is that such a pivotal pivotal moment in Jim's life? Well, it was interesting, Richard. Um, after spending quite a bit of time with Jim, after I knew that I wanted to do this book, I, I realized I hadn't really asked him what the quintessential mountain adventure was in his story. And I was surprised when he started telling this story about a lesser known peak in Alaska called Thunder Mountain that was actually a secondary objective on a trip where they couldn't do the mountain that they wanted to do. They looked across the valley and saw this other peak and thought that there was a compelling line on that peak. And then they had a, a, a terribly tragic accident in which Jim's partner was very badly injured. And he had to make his way down the mountain on his own to try and get a rescue organized for its friend against tremendous odds. And he saw that because of its emphasis on partnership, because of its emphasis on doing what needs to be done, because of the, um, the drama of the story as the really ideal mountain adventure amongst all the things that he had done. That's the one that he felt really captured the, the spirit of climbing, which to Jim is very, very much about reliance on your partner, digging in when challenges happen and really understanding what it is that you're made of. And and Jim's ascent down Thunder Mountain to go and get a rescue for his friend Malcolm Daly, who was injured, really speaks to what it takes in the mountains to go beyond yourself and to really dig down in and figure out what you're capable of doing. There's a line he says uh, about that, uh, you know, getting down the mountain, getting the rescue was, all your life has been a preparation for this moment, which I just found such a powerful way to look at this tragedy as a psych psychological clinical psychologist. Like there must be something in his approach to life that, you know, lets him deal with this type of stress in such a such a powerful way. Yeah, I thought it was pretty remarkable when he first started telling me the story. I, I knew some details of the story, but not the extent to which he really had to. Uh, turn on a different gear and and really do something um, quite extraordinary in getting down a, a very complicated peak across some very technical terrain and um, trying to go out in search of a rescue that he didn't know would be possible to happen. But one of the ways that he dealt with that was to look inside of himself and say, it's okay, all the experiences you've ever had 
our preparation for what you have to do right now. And one of the things that I think is quite unique about Jim as a person, uh, but also as a climber, is his capacity to um, simply sh turn off some of the natural fears that we all have, some of the doubts that we have about ourselves, some of the uncertainties um, about what we're facing. And, and he did an exceptional job that day of, of just saying to himself, even though he was injured as well, he, um, he was hit by uh, his partner who fell about 180 feet and bounced off him partway down the fall. And so Jim was quite injured and he had to deal with that uh, in his descent. But the ability to, to simply say, I'm just going to do what needs to be done was, was really quite remarkable. And I think um, I, I completely agreed with him that there was a very telling insight into what makes him unusual as a person, which is, again, that ability to look inside and, and turn off the fear, turn off the doubt, turn off the the questions about um, what's going to happen next and just just be purely, truly in the moment. And to the point you made a few minutes ago about the um, other things that he's had to face in his life, he's been able to do exactly that same kind of compartmentalizing in other parts of his life as well. And I think from a psychological point of view, that's both very much a strength because it allows you to get yourself through all kinds of difficult situations. But I think one of the most compelling parts of this whole uh, book on Jim is how he's also understood that that ability to turn things off hasn't always been his friend because it's allowed him to not have to process and, and learn from some of the things in his life until later in his life. And I, I do think, and he's he certainly spoken about this with me quite a bit, that the actual process of doing this journey of the book together has been something of a revelation for him where he actually has, because someone like me is looking at his life from a distance, he's had to look at it himself in some different ways and, and has come to some conclusions, some revelations about uh, who he is and how he got to where he is in his life. Now, uh, many of the listeners probably have never heard of Jim Denny, but within the climbing community, what sets him apart as such a, a special individual? Well, certainly the um, the kind of accomplishments that he's had. You know, uh, it's interesting when you say that a lot of people may not have heard about him. I, I think that's actually true with a, a lot of the... Um, the really high-end climbers of Jim's generation. So uh, he's in his, um, he's just going to turn 80 in uh, a couple of months. Um, he comes from a generation of climbers, particularly American climbers, who really felt that the most important thing was climbing rather than talking about it. So they didn't keep journals. They didn't do a lot of writing. They didn't um, present their, their climbs very often. They actually felt that um, not talking about their accomplishments was a bit, bit of a badge of honor. So um, a lot of the people of his generation aren't that well known, but their exploits have become pretty well known. So Jim has been a participant in an incredible number of really important high-end technical adventures in the world of climbing uh, over many, many generations in both rock climbing and um, alpinism or, or mountain climbing at a very high level and has really set the bar for um, a lot of up-and-coming climbers across several generations who know the difficulty of the things that he's done, know that uh, he and his partners did some incredible climbs in some very difficult conditions with a really high ethical standard about the way that they do climbs. And I think that um, while, while a lot of the public knows about, you know, more famous climbs like Mount Everest or Denali in Alaska or um, climbs in the Alps, that the kinds of climbs that, that Jim was doing, really technical, but smaller peaks carried out by small teams in the uh, highest standard of minimal impact really uh, set the stage for the kind of climbing that's become hugely important um, around the world to, to the, the higher levels of climbers over the course of several generations. 
when when somebody looks at kind of a cursory look at somebody's life, you look at Jim's life, it seems like this incredible life of traveling the world, doing these great climbs. Uh, but there's a quote where Jim says something to the effect of no one would ever want to go through what I, what I have had to just to live this life. Can you maybe talk about the sacrifices he had to make in terms of living this, you know, from one point of view, this incredibly successful life as a climber. On the other point of view, a really tough life. Yeah, it's a very interesting question around the things that he's had to balance out. And I, I think that in some ways his story is very unique because some of the things in the rest of his life that he's had to deal with have been quite extreme. At the same time, um, there, are, there are lots of situations where we, particularly with, with um, outdoor risk-taking adventurers, we think of their accomplishments as the things that um, most give them acclaim, if, if you will. That, that's the thing we know them most for, and it's pretty easy to, to not pay attention to other parts of, of a person's life. And one of the things for Jim is that some of the, um, the personal experiences he has gone through, um, some mental health issues with a spouse, uh, mental health and addictions issues with uh, both of his children, the loss of his son to a drug overdose, uh, the loss of his daughter essentially from uh, pretty early in her teens to the streets, um, the death of his twin brother from cancer at a pretty young age. There's just one thing after the other um, in his family story that have been very, very difficult to deal with that had an impact on his climbing. But they were things that um, I think he turned um, to climbing to try and give us give him some solace from some of the things that he was facing. But it was never always quite enough. There were times when the mountains would give him peace, would give him uh, a way of kind of um, coming back again into the world when he'd been facing these really difficult things in his home life. But at a certain point, he was dealing with so many things that the mountains weren't offering him the solace that he had uh, hoped they could be and needed them to be in some ways. So I think when he talks about um, no one would want to have what he had to go through, I think that really speaks to, it's easy to look at his accomplishments and say, wow, what an amazing life he's had. All of these trips, all of these successful summits, all these travels around the world, but behind the curtain of, of those successes has been these other things that he's had to deal with, which have been incredibly human tragedies. And ultimately, I think they're the, the really the more interesting part of his story, particularly when it's combined with the, um, the great successes that he's had. Yeah, reading the book, I just felt you know, horrible for the trauma he was having to deal with, with his children, uh, just in his life in general. And it was just just heartbreaking. As you said, he would just escape to the mountains. If you could go back 40 years and you were his best buddy, is escaping to the mountains the best way to deal with this? Or how would you have, you know, would you have advised him to, you know, maybe look for some other ways to try and deal with what just must have been devastating events in, in his life? Yeah, that's a very complicated question. I think that, um, you know, some of the people in his life wish that there could have been more direct ways of dealing with things. Um, you know, I can speak as a psychologist that I think things like counseling can be, you know, ways of, of dealing with things. But I think for Jim, particularly um, at the time that he was doing these things in the 1970s and 1980s, when he did his, his really, um, truly great ascents, he was part of a world that didn't really turn to those other things. They, they truly believed in the unique power of adventure and in particular um, challenging mountain experiences to cleanse the soul, to um, to show you what you're truly about, to re-energize you. And I think it took many, many years of that to realize that these things um, weren't as much of the fix as he, but also a lot of other people around him hoped that they would be. And a number of his friends that I spoke to um, talked about that as well, that, you know, they... They had had similar experiences of some challenges in in relationships or work or, you know, other everyday things that mountains actually did kind of heal for them. And I think the difference with Jim was the magnitude of some of the things that he was dealing with didn't allow as much of a of a cure. 
And it, it was interesting, I think, for him to, through the, pro, the, the course of uh, working on this book and, and hearing the conversations that I had with other people, um, it was interesting for him to, to hear that other people saw w that the mountains were not quite fixing him or giving him the, the relief that uh, he hoped. And a, a number of people that had done things with him in that time said that, you know, they saw the, the tremendous pressures on him. And while they'd always wished that the mountains could fix things for their friend, um, as they had seen it then be able to do in the past, that they started to realize that that wasn't so much the case um, anymore. So there, I think in the book, there are some pretty compelling moments where Jim uh, literally and figuratively on some of his ascents kind of hits a wall and he realizes, I, I can't do this thing at the highest level that I, that I need to be doing it because I'm distracted by these, these other things that in, in his life that are in so many ways more fundamentally, fundamentally important than what he's doing in the mountains. But the mountains are always there as this promise of, of healing. Uh, what comes through in the book is Jim's focus on the team. For his climbs and i'm interested in you know your thoughts on on why this was you know so important for jim i assume this is important for everyone you know every time i do anything it's the people i'm doing it with is really important but it seems with jim it was one step even more why do you think that was well there's a few reasons for that i think one of them is um through a, a combination of circumstances jim ended up um becoming a green beret in the early 1960s and he talked quite a bit about that experience, um, being part of a platoon of Green Berets, how close and tight people got, how much they started to understand they could rely on one another. Um, at that point in time, he, he describes himself as never really having been part of a team. He was, he was an outstanding athlete as a young man, but more in individual sports like track and field. And then when he um, he joined the Green Berets, he he became part of um, almost like a, a second family, where he really knew that he could trust these people. He really knew that whatever circumstance they found themselves in, they'd be able to work together and rise above. And that at um, different moments, every single individual in a platoon would be able to step up and do what needed to be done. And and he describes that as showing him a very important insight into the mountain world, how you need to be able to 100% trust your partner. You need to be able to share all of your decisions. You need to be able to know that the other person is absolutely there for you and will step it up and in to the game when you can't. And I think that um, he's had, particularly at the level that he was climbing, he had so many situations where it was fundamentally important that your partner was just as committed, just as talented, just as um, involved in the moment as, as you are. That's not always the case in every mountaineering experience where, uh, particularly when objectives are a bit easier, you might be able to um, pull the rest of the team along, but but not in the situations that Jim was in because the um, the demand um, of the level of climbing, the level of challenge, the level of risk were all so high that you you really, really needed to have a partner who was absolutely there. Now, I'm interested, you're the founder of Watershed, where you help companies and leaders reach their fullest potential. Can you take anything from Jim's focus on team and his success into a, a business environment? And you know how important are teams amongst companies for their ultimate success? Um, so one of the things that that's really been interesting in my work as an organizational development consultant with Watershed has been um, an opportunity that I've had to have conversations about risk taking with business leaders. And one of the things that um, experiences of just, um, talking to people like Jim have shown me is the ability of someone to understand the role of risk in their lives and to have a sensible approach to risk is critically important. And I think Jim is superb at that. He's he's very, very good, in part in a compartmentalized kind of way, but even more so, I think, in a, a 
clarity of um, of self awareness, of understanding of what he's capable of, so that he's he's able to look at risky situations and say, "How can I break this down so that I can manage risk in the most appropriate way? How can I?" Um, turn to those parts of myself that I know have the capacity to get me through this, to not let um, worry get in the way and and to really focus on what I'm good at and um, positive outcomes in, in everything that I'm going to do. And I think more than anybody I've ever met in the mountains, and I have had the opportunity to climb um, directly with Jim, I've seen a remarkable capacity in him to just be able to do what needs to be done, to just kind of flip a switch somehow and and just dig in and do the things that need is, needs to be done. And I, I think that that's a huge um, leadership talent to be able to to do that kind of thing. And and um, I can certainly say from my, my moments of climbing with Jim, but also hearing about him from lots of other people, it can be incredibly inspirational to see somebody who can do that because it... Um, it just calms you right down when you're around somebody like that. One thing that was interesting is, is Jim was really famous for wanting to do first descents, but he didn't want any information. He wanted to kind of go in there and figure it out. Why, why do you think he preferred this approach? Because I think he's very much a pioneer. He tells stories of being a, a young boy and, and being really inspired by um, adventures where you get lost, adventures where you have no idea where you are and um, really facing those kinds of things head on. So when when it came to the mountains, it's, it's pretty interesting with him that um, he so much prefers to figure things out on his own that he's notoriously unprepared sometimes. You know, he, um, he will say things like he wants to... Um, learn about a mountain by climbing a mountain rather than by reading anything about it. So he has gone into some big ascents with no idea that somebody's actually done the climb before him, uh, no idea how to get down a mountain when he's gotten to the top of something, um, showing up without quite the right gear and, and so on. But to him, that just enriches the experience. So, you know, I, I think um, in some funny ways that's uh, caused him to rely a bit more on on his partners who come with a bit more knowledge about some of the things that he does. But in a sense, there's, there's kind of um, a beautiful naivety in, in the way that he approaches things, you know, in this era where any activity you're doing anywhere in the world, you can go online and, and find out, you know, 10,000 facts about the place that um, you want to go. Even if nobody's even been there before, you can still find all kinds of information about, um, you know, why that place would be amazing to go to. Jim just doesn't do that. He um, he relies on the you know f- uh, thoughts of others that he that he's going to go with. He relies on his ability to to look at a map and figure out that would be a, a pretty cool mountain to go into without necessarily looking too much into um, routes that other people have taken to get to a mountain or routes that people have done on the mountain itself. He is much more driven by the the pure aesthetics of. Um, a place, and particularly by the aesthetics, aesthetics of exploration. He loves that stuff. Do you think we as a society are, are losing something by having all this information? When I first started going to the mountains, all we had was a physical map. And now on virtually anything I want to do, there's a YouTube video. There's probably 100 YouTube videos and 50 articles. What are we losing is just regular people that like to have fun in the mountains by having all this information. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting point, and it's actually um, at the heart of one of the biggest lessons that I learned from Jim, and and that's that um, I'm with you. I I think today that we have too much information, that it's it's hard to have pure adventures, particularly of an exploratory nature anymore, because so many places have gone and travel has changed so much, and we have um, just so much information at our fingertips all the time. And what Jim showed me was you just have to not look <laughs> and, and and particularly go to places that, that you believe other people haven't gone. And if you don't get the information, then you're having an exploration just like anybody who goes to a, you know, a place for the first time in the 1400s or the 1920s or any other time. Just 
just go and and believe that you'll figure it out along the way. And I, I think that um, over the, the past um, couple of years of writing this book, I, I kept that in mind a number of times when I went out and and went on some adventures and uh, myself and and just thought you know I'm just going to I'm just going to not look I'm going to I'm just going to go and and try and figure things out as, as I go so I put aside route descriptions I put aside maps I I did some things like that and just went a little bit less prepared and and uh, I appreciated the beauty that he's talking about because it's um it's a pretty magical thing there's something special when there's an unexpected joy I think with being in the mountains or even traveling where you don't know and something just mesmerizes you, a great view, uh, particularly, uh, you know, f finding a bakery in the middle of nowhere and having a great, you know, cafe and uh, croissant, like that can make a day. But if you know it's there, it loses all like the specialty. It's these hundreds of little, you know, pockets of joy that you get when you don't have everything planned out that I think makes a lot of life really rewarding. Yeah. To go back to your earlier question about... Um, you know, what's special about Jim, though? I, I think one of the things that's a component part of this that's that's really, really interesting is um, his capacity to suffer is legendary. So when, when he goes into a place without any information, he is willing to face down the consequences of that lack of information, like getting lost, like having um, terrible terrain to move through because it's not the best way to... Uh, approach a river valley, um, being willing to, to suffer for day after day of bushwhacking and, and so on. And, and it's, um, it's pretty funny to talk to some of his partners that, you know, will remark on particularly now that he's in his 70s, 70s and almost his 80s, that his capacity to, to really, really push himself through hard things and revel in it. I mean, he, he talks about there's never a time that he's happier than when he's sleeping on rocky ground when he doesn't have a tent, when there's a storm happening, when he's suffering up on high ledge somewhere, that that he's got a a pretty um, amazing uh, ability to be able to sit through moments like that and gain the best out of them, and he um, he does so with kind of a sneer on his face and a snarl in his voice, but but he will tell you that he loves those kinds of moments, and and that's that's part of what allows you to appreciate. Um, those kinds of adventures that you're talking about is that willingness to just accept what whatever happens as part of that. As he got older, he started to give back, and I found his involvement with the Pamiri Alpine Club really interesting. Can you maybe share a little bit about what he achieved there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jim really has come up with a philosophy about giving back, um, seeing it as a responsibility that we as adventurers really have, that if if we know that adventure has given us some amazing things, then we should do whatever it takes as community members to try and give back to, to that community. Um, his work in Tajikistan came uh, to some extent by accident. He was um, involved in another community-based um, trip. In the 1990s, um, there was a, an attempt to, uh, by the American Alpine Club to bridge with the Iranian Mountain Club. And um, Jim was involved in that, a, a quite a remarkable thing that um, really believed in the power of mountains to connect people of different cultures, even um, between two countries that had long been involved in a struggle. And it was a very successful trip. And um, piggybacking on, on top of that, Jim had this opportunity with another member of the trip to go to the country of Tajikistan um, in um, Central Asia. And really went in again with no sense of what that place was going to be or what the objectives were going to be like there other than it was kind of an ideal place for Jim with his exploratory drive that very little was known about it. There seemed to be uh, hundreds if not thousands of unclimbed peaks in the area of different sizes and different difficulties. And, and he went there thinking that he was going there to climb, but I think the, um, the real thing that captivated him was the people. And he took a look around him at these amazing mountain people who had incredible mountain terrain that was very little known by the world, and, and he had the foresight to think this could be a pretty incredible place for people 
who wanted to have exploratory experiences like him, who wanted to see um, a very different land than um, they might get in some other parts of Asia or other mountain places around the world. So he, um, through his connection to the American Alpine Club um, and to um, Black Diamond, the gear company, uh, took it upon himself with some other people who were on that trip to think about supporting the development of a similar national alpine club in Tajikistan, um, where the Pamir Mountains are. So he he worked with some local people and in a very short period of time managed to um, be part of an effort to help to set up some uh, infrastructure for trekking and climbing in Tajikistan, which he still says is is one of the um the most remarkable amazing places he's ever had the opportunity to climb and um really over the course of, of just a couple of visits he was very much a part of really transforming um i don't think it's a stretch to say transforming that country it it really made a difference so that people have started to go to tajikistan now and and recognize the um the amazing potential of this this mountain range that sits at the western um, edge of the Himalaya and, and just has an incredible collection of unknown, unclimbed, even unseen peaks. Jim was able to climb into his 70s. He's still quite active. And I'm always really impressed and and almost jealous of people who are so active, you know, late into life. What do you think his secret of having this, you know, incredible ability to still get out and do the outdoor things he loves as he ages? Well, I wouldn't want to underestimate the role of, of simple genetics. I mean, he's, <laughs> um, he's a tall, gaunt, um, spidery kind of man. And, and I think that that, um, you know, his, his seeming inability to put on the, the kind of weight that, that most of the rest of us put on when we head into our 60s and 70s has been a, a huge part of that. Um, but there's there's other things at play there too. One is he's um, he's got an incredible um, natural athletic ability that, that has allowed him to excel at all kinds of different sports over the course of his life. Um, and he has a remarkable drive that's backed up with a tenacity that um, I think is is very very unusual. He um, I, I remember the first time that I went climbing with him and I, I saw him kind of um, stick his teeth into a climb and it, it was quite remarkable watching him. He um, he just dives in and he is incredibly lithe and strong and this was in his 70s and just has such a natural talent. His, um, his footwork, his uh, root finding ability, his... Um, sense making on on rock was was pretty remarkable, and I've seen some very very good rock climbers um, over the course of the fifty years or so that I've been involved in the mountain world, and and Jim is certainly right up there with them. And and um, the other thing though that I, th I think is really really important is um, he's he's managed to happily shift his focus from um, simple high-end technical achievement to a more exploratory approach to adventure. And that has allowed him to continue to do things because when his body might not allow him to do the highest end technical things, his willingness to both to suffer, as I mentioned before, but also um, to actually go exploring means that he can still get just as much joy out of the mountains, even if he's not climbing technically at the level that, that he once was. So he is going out still these days with um, younger and younger folks um, and and showing them how this is done. He's, he's got a tremendous role as a mentor. And um, boy, the, the younger folks in their 20s and 30s that I spoke to for the book, they just adore his um his attitude his willingness to push his willingness um, to suffer in order to to do these magical things that he drags them out on and they'll continuously say that he's 
stronger, faster, smarter than they are in the mountains in their 20s and 30s. It's, it's fabulous to hear. In reading the book, I felt like there were so many insights and, you know, for me, you know, how I may want to live my life or, you know, things I can take from reading about Jim's life. But in writing the book, is there a, a powerful lesson you took away from getting to know Jim and then writing this book about him? Yeah, that's a, it's a very interesting question. The, the process of writing this book was was really quite challenging. And, and I think it, it goes to the question of exploring those other sides of, of a, an adventure life, the, the personal side, the family side of things. Um, you know, I, I certainly felt that um, the agonies that Jim has gone through in his life were, were very much a part of this project. And um, to be submersed in some of the the really, really challenging um, life events that that he's gone through was was quite personally difficult for me as well, because I was, um, you know, I, I was set into another person's life that that has had some incredible hardship and and some really difficult awakenings. And um, that's that's hard to be part of that stuff, you know, and I, I think this, um, as much as any other project I've ever been involved with, um, this felt like part therapy, part, part journalism, part, um, shared experience of another person's life. And, um, yeah, I, I, I won't lie to you. It was a, it was a, a, a really difficult process to do and to try and do it with respect and um, fairness and openness was was really a challenge. And you know, there there are all kinds of things about Jim's life story that are in the book, but there's also all kinds of things that aren't in the book. Out of that, uh, hope for respect and and fairness, and that's a that's a really challenging balancing act to try and figure out how to do. And, and I think, um, you know, if I, if I was left with one really great lesson from a, a writing perspective, um, it's a lesson that, uh, another friend of mine who's done a, a lot of biography writing shared with me of just a simple mantra of don't write biographies of people who are still alive because they're, you know, you, you have to put these things in front of people. And, um, when a life has been difficult, that's a really challenging thing to do to, you know, to say or to observe some things and say some things about another person's life. And, and, you know, it certainly came to my attention through this project of um, appreciating Jim's willingness to have me dig into his story and an appreciation that I don't think very many people would want to have a biographer diving into their life. I mean, it's, I think all of us have had things in our lives that we kind of prefer that somebody doesn't dig into and do some evaluation and assessment and particularly judgment of. And, and um, I really had to give him credit for his willingness to to open the, the door of his life and, and share some things and tell me some things and, and hear some things that um, were just, they were hard. Well, the, the outcome of the book is an incredible read. I, my test is if I take the book when I go on the treadmill, I know it's a good book. And so uh, I, I think I read the whole book in one weekend. I kind of couldn't put it down. And my wife came down. Yeah, and I had my Kindle on just reading away on the treadmill. Uh, so uh, thanks for coming on the show. And thanks for uh, writing the book. It was a great read. Oh, I'm so so thankful that you enjoyed it and that you had me on. Uh, and if people want to find the book, where can they find it? Uh, it's certainly available uh, online through Amazon. The uh, publisher is The Mountaineers out of Seattle, and they have it in their catalog for ordering as well. And it should be in bookstores um, very, very soon. It just, just uh, the print edition just came out. Excellent. So I'll put links uh, to where you can find the book in the show notes. And with that, thanks for listening to this episode of the 10 Adventures podcast. We'll be back next week to explore the world and hear about more epic adventures.
Start planning your own adventure by visiting us at 10adventures.com and listen to other episodes of the 10 Adventures podcast on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you find your podcasts.